Before we start, I would just like to say um, it'd be really, really cool if people would uh, mind just turning on their videos uh, or like being present just because I find it really difficult to teach to like an empty room. Um, and also large parts of this workshop are going to be just talking to each other and bouncing ideas off one another. So if it's interactive, obviously it'd be nice for people to have their videos on as well. Um, yeah, F, if you can't, obviously you can't, such as life. Hi, Julia. Okay, cool. So let's start. This is an education workshop, not gonna be the most complicated thing in the world, but a brief rundown is just first gonna chat about theory. So what is the point of education? Just because framing education debates is really important to winning them. Um, then we're gonna chat a bit about balancing, protecting children, maximizing learning, which is like a key clash. We'll talk about some of the challenges education systems face, inequality, how parents interact with education, the social schools, governments, that kind of thing. Cool. So let's start with the purpose of education. Um, hi, thank you for turning on your cameras. That's really nice of you. So there are like a bunch of different ways to frame the purpose of education, right? Like I'm sure that all of you guys have said, ah, the most important thing for education is to give kids skills because the skills are what they need to succeed in the real world TM. Um, and I'm sure you've also been like, no, 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 the most important thing is to do well in school because then you have good grades and therefore good qualifications, which means that you can do things such as going to good universities, which is going to get you a good career, right? So these are like different ways to frame the purpose of education, but ultimately it really just boils down to making sure that kids do well in the real world. I just want to add one thing, which is really like fun. Um, like as opposed to these relatively stock ways of framing debates, which is just that I think that a good way to frame school is a miniature um, of the real, real world. So like thinking about a lot of the things that kids do in school and also in their childhood. Um, so for example, playing with toys, for example, as a preparation for the real world. Like, I'm not sure I was socialized female, which meant that my parents gave me cooking sets. Um, some of my male friends got like train sets, like these kinds of things are kind of just because humans see play um, and school as a, mini as a mini version of real of the real world, which is why in school dynamics actually matter. Um, like it can often be difficult to say that, like for example, in this house would abolish single sex schools. One key op gov argument is, oh, this makes kids bad at socializing with guys or bad at socializing with girls and so on and so forth. But it's hard to explain why. Um, and why is socializing with children outside of schools is not enough. And having that frame of the interactions you have in school are a microcosm of what you expect to have in society at large. Um, and the power dynamics within the classroom, for example, are really, 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 basically just a blueprint for future actions too. Um, I was in student council. I'm not sure if you guys were, you might've been. Um, as I've become older, I've been like, Realistically, student council didn't matter at all. Like maybe we were able to ban plastic straws or something, but ultimately we didn't make any meaningful decisions. So retroactively, I realized that it was really just opportunity to practice and basically pretend at having leadership roles in the real world um, and learning how to communicate with people outside of your immediate circle, for example. So yeah, that's just a cool frame I like. And then the final thing that we can say is just, you know, actually one of the core functions of school is to become good people um for example like we are told lots of different stories and anecdotes where the strong moral uh, takeaway um we are disproportionately punished for things even if they're victimless if we dress inappropriately for example um or if we do things such as cheat on a test even though ultimately especially at primary school there is no real harm to this um, so we can give arguments both for and against this because there are some reasons why schools are likely to do this well. For example, understanding there are consequences to your actions, even if there is no immediate harm to yourself, is important to making you more moral in the real world. But at the same time, we can give reasons why schools are likely to be terrible actors and propagate bad moral values and ideals. So yeah, those are actually four separate ways of framing the purpose of education. Um, and the reason why it's useful to have four different frames is because you can run the same argument, i.e. which is better for fulfilling the basic purpose of education and making kids as well off as possible, no matter which side of the debate you're on. Cool. So one really, really classic trade-off is about skills versus succeeding within the system. Um, because this house believes that standardized testing does more good than harm, for example, is definitely a motion where 
there's a trade-off between doing really, really well in tests and therefore succeeding and going to good colleges versus acquiring skills, if that makes sense. And this probably applies to other motions too. Um, so for example, motions about whether or not X subject should be mandatory, very much also about maximizing skills learned um, versus trading off time that could be spent studying or just things like tiger parenting, for example. So I'm just gonna ask you guys, like, if, I'm tr if you are on side proposition for standardized testing does more good than harm, for example, are you advocating for skills or succeeding within the system at the very, at the most basic level? Obviously, both sides are going to say, ah, oh, we can have some of both. But at the end of the day, the even ifing is going to be about trading one over the other. So which one is it on top? Okay, so my, intui my intuition was actually that it might be an op claim, um, just because like, a lot, like the main op case is basically just that it's really, really bad. Standardized testing is really bad because it just teaches kids how to cram. Um, and that's an unrealistic skill set that doesn't ultimately have a much of a function outside of the school system because the internet means that memorizing information is no longer so relevant, right? So I was thinking that believing that standardized testing does more good than harm is actually a reason um, that you might have to frame succeeding within the system as more important. So can we have some wing to explain why that might be the case and how you might win this trade off in a debate? You can unmute yourself and speak. I guess if you're like on Gov, this is if you're on Gov, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. So I think you can say while well, skills are important at the end of the day, if you don't have standardized tests, Mm -hmm. um, it's likely going to be much harder for those who maybe don't go to schools with other forms of tests succeed in higher education, which still requires you to take standardized tests to an extent. Yeah, agreed. Um, and when we're weighing, that's good. When we're weighing though, what we want to do is weigh against the best form of the op case. Um, so we want to consider, look, what's the best form of the op case? It's about Without standardized testing, kids have lots of time to maximize their interests, develop unique skills. Perhaps that make the, might make them more appealing um, to some universities, who knows? Given that, how would you outweigh the strongest form of the health case? And say, despite all this, we still think that standardized testing and succeeding within the system is the most important issue. Uh, maybe we can talk about how succeeding within the system gives you a kind of backup mean that even if you fail in your hobbies or your pursuits, there will still be a backup that you have. Yeah, that's really, really good. I.e. that we should be as risk averse as possible. And even if abandoning standardized testing allows some kids the freedom to do whatever the hell they want, there's also no safety net for those children who might be less lucky and less able to latch on to skills or pursuits that make them really stand out from the crowd and guarantee them a position in a really competitive competitive education, right? And that we should protect those at the bottom as opposed to maximizing success at the top. The other thing I was thinking was also just that oftentimes standardized testing and succeeding within the system is a prerequisite towards developing high skills. So for example, that look, even if you have amazing skills, if your high school GPA is like a 2.3, or if you like fail half your subjects, no school is going to give you a second glance, right? Um, so on that basis, we should care more about making sure that kids are, have this basic level of qualification as opposed to maximizing learning of skills. Okay, so let's flip this. If we're often trying to argue that standardized testing does more harm than good, how can we prove that skills are actually more important, even if that leads to less short-term success within the system? I think we can use your third frame in terms of preparing for the real world. Mm -hmm. Like you can particularly say that uh, point of time you acquire these skills will be more suited handle stuff uh, and like, handle like the real world challenges in a way rather than like a standard testing which only makes you like study a particular subject or like learn theoretical stuff which uh, may not be that helpful. Good. Um, let's try and bring these claims to their final conclusion. So why is it that given what you've just said, Rashtun, that having 
fewer skills is going to do more to harm your quality of life than succeeding within the system. Because ultimately this debate is about the well-being of these kids inside and outside of school, right? Um, can we talk about how in many places you don't have a structure that you can fall upon? For example, in on a developed nation, oftentimes mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you are if you have four GP, you are still going to be unemployed. So at that time, you have to di distinguish yourself from the crowd or do things that can bring value that oftentimes yeah. standardized testing doesn't help you with. One hundred percent. That is that I think you can actually even expand what the context of your claim from beyond developing countries where there is no pre-established structure, that means that if you have a high GP that guarantees your position in a good school, we can actually even say, even in the developing world, the advent of automation, the gig economy, other changes in the labor market means that having good grades no longer guarantees you employability. And what's actually far, far more important is base skills, like people skills, the ability to communicate, ability to research, these basic skills, which mean that you're very, very adaptable and flexible within the job market, which means you're much, much more able to cope with changes in the job and labor market, which is inevitably going to happen. Cool. So that's nice. We've just done the base level weighing. I hope this gives you like a good top level framework of what's necessary in some debates. Do people have questions before I move on? Okay, so we've discussed one core clash in education debates, which is often about skills versus success, but there are other core clashes which happen all the time in education debates. So for example, about protecting the child in the immediate term versus maximizing their long-term success. Like this is a very, very familiar core clash, banning single sex schools, academic stream in primary and secondary schools, creation of LGBTQ plus phony schools. Like you guys see the common thread, right? that a lot of the prop teams are about, a, a lot of the prop, like, no, one side is like, we should do this because that makes them more successful in the long term, even if in the short term, they have an adjustment period, whereas op is like, no, 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 short term happiness is a prerequisite towards long term growth, wherever it's just much more important to protect the child right now. Cool. So let's just practice this. What's the most obvious argument for, um, for the creation of LGBTQ plus only schools? Um, the fact that uh, many of the uh, many children from the LGBT community, LGBTQ community um, face lifelong problems because they are extreme, they are bullied to a, a really extreme extent. So protecting that, that is far important than you know them able to them being able to have a slightly better interaction with the outer world. I think protection yes. from the harassment is far more important. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And how about the op main op argument? in this debate? Um, I think the op argument would probably be about normalizing interactions with these um, students of the LGBTQ plus community to ensure that maybe that harassment would decrease over time. Yeah, I agree that that's one of the main op claims about the LGBTQ plus community overall. I do think though that there is one argument which centers more on the well-being of kids, um, which comes from op, which is um, I think you can say potentially that while they might be safe or safer in these schools, ultimately it's going to end and there isn't going to be LGBTQ plus workplaces. So it's almost going to be somewhat of culture shock if they haven't mm -hmm. been in like non LGBTQ plus yeah. for a long period of time. And it will likely like the harassment and all of the other things will be much more amplified because they haven't learned the skills to deal with it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. That if all your life you're used to being treated with respect and dignity from everyone else, that suddenly emerging into a workspace where your boss might be really, really transphobic and constantly misgender you, for example, would be really, really debilitating um, in a context where you have no protection whatsoever. Cool. So yeah, we have both the most important prop argument and the most important op argument um, on the fundamental clash about what's better for kids um, in LGBTQ plus schools. So let's do the wing. On prop, if what we care most about is protecting the kids, why? Like, why does this outweigh long-term job success or like your stability within the workplace? Um, I think um, what we could say for Gov is that 
these children need to feel safe with their own identity first before you can make them um, even prioritize preparing them for a job um, opportunity. So you need them to feel comfortable with friends that people accept them first. So in essence. I like that. I think you're on the right track. But I think what you're doing is kind of just stating the trade-off as opposed to explaining why the trade-off should exist. Because you're, what you've told me is that we should just say that the basics of forming decent social relations with your friends is more important um, and should happen before long-term acclimatization within the workplace. But why? Can we talk about how um, many of your relationships or many of your circles and the way you interact with people are formed in an early age? Um, and if you don't keep children in a school where they're they can meet new people where they can meet people of different backgrounds, then it's likely that after they, let's say, graduate from grade 12, they'll probably not have a different circle because they have never interacted with them. Uh, what you're saying is that it's much, that like, it's very, very important to build up a child's sense of self from a young age, right? Um, and that internal confidence is a prerequisite towards pushing back against attacks when you're an adult, for example, or navigating in social environments. Yep, that's perfect. That's one. But two, what's the most, that's great. You're co-opting the op case. Let's find another weighing mechanism though. And we want a super, super obvious one, which is imagine yourself as a parent of a little queer child. What's the single biggest reason why you would prioritize protecting them right now over making sure they succeed in the long term? Um, I think it's about active analysis, whether or not children are capable of dealing with those attacks they're not capable so you can protect them for right now and then tease them that you can probably go out to outer worlds for example creating lgbt schools but with clubs that have let's say outer interaction you can prepare them slowly instead of just throwing them into a world where they are going to get harassed yeah sure that works as well i do think that's slightly mitigatory um what i'm looking at, but that works what i'm looking for is just a much more fundamental reason like for, okay, fine. Maybe you guys can't imagine being parents. Imagine you have a small sibling. The sibling is perhaps seven years old. Why is it that you don't want to yeet the sibling into a vicious school where they will be bullied and harassed? Like, what's your first reason as a person, not as a debater? Probably you don't want them to, like, uh, I mean, face the kind of trauma that uh, you, you probably faced when you were younger. Like, I mean, or no, or like what many uh, LGBTQ individuals face when they are younger, which is a life, which leaves a lifelong impression, which is something uh, that uh, like gives them uh, a lot of problems later, stuff, stuff like uh, in their personal interactions and all with other individuals. Yeah, so that's a good wing mechanism. It's kind of a little bit off the bullseye, but close, which is just that long-term irreversible trauma is worse than quantitative differences in your wage or your employability in the long run. The easiest response that I just got from the chat is just protecting your kid is kind of good. Reasons being, your kid is small, it is fragile, it cannot defend itself, it's very, very vulnerable. Um, and therefore, the most important thing is just protect them from incredible amounts of pain, right? Um, that is that it's just not legit, it's not justified to force a kid, for example, to run over like hot coals just because that will build up their strength and their endurance and their strength of character and in the same way we shouldn't deliberately impose pain on a young child who can't do anything about it just for their long-term prospects which are you know improbable at best right so yeah the takeaway from that was just one be human when you're debating about in education debates it's really important to be human um, and to remind the judge that you're discussing little babies a lot of the time, who, if you saw in person, probably be like, oh, oh my God, so small, need to be protected. Like similarly, just being human and letting your softer emotions come out in debate and trying to articulate that is often very, very useful for having more human and compelling characterization as well as impacting your arguments better. Okay, let's do the flip. Why is it that it's actually preferable for us to, and like, even if it makes, children's lives slightly harder why is it more why is it still just why is it still more important to make sure that they're prepared to enter the real world and notice how I kind of changed my language to frame the issue I changed my language from this is incredible and irreversible trauma when I was on prop to kids lives become slightly harder um, when I was on op 
So let's do the op weighing. Why is it that this is basically you care about long-term success more? Um, my idea for that is for um, op, you can talk about how in, in the future when you're an adult already, that's when your decisions and your interactions are more impactful and they're more permanent. Yes. Um, as a kid, you have a safety net. You have the capacity to absorb harms because your parents are still there. So mm -hmm. um, better to prepare them in a real world where you they have to be tough at that point. And mm -hmm. the comparative is if they don't, they will suffer uh, greatly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So both what you just said and also what Lauren just texted in the chat. Um, and I think that's two main things, right? One is that kids are just, you can make arguments that children are actually slightly more emotionally resilient, even though that's kind of hard to prove. But second of all, and much more trivially, it's just the case that you always have support structures, backup structures, people to have your back if you're pushed around in school, perhaps to put you somewhere else, for example, or to find you a counselor. Whereas as an adult, you're juggling a billion different things. You're juggling your economic obligations, perhaps also interpersonal relations. Are you trying to hold a relationship together? Are you trying to make sure you don't get evicted? Like all these different pressures make each individual impact actually much, much worse. And the possibility of losing your job, for example, is far more impactful and irreversible than as a kid. So yeah, those are like two separate weighing mechanisms, I think. One about resilience and two about how severe the impact is. So that's great. I am very happy with this. We've discussed two classic clashes. So about skills versus success and about protecting a child in the immediate term versus maximizing the growth in the long term. And the reason why understanding that these are classic clashes is really, really useful is because, um, especially in top half, what I really like to do is just predict what the first principle clash of the debate is and write out reasons for the even if for me to like just put out there in deputy um, and for the judge to be like, ah, yes, this is the most relevant issue indeed. Um, or in order to frame your ideas as more relevant, for example, in BP. Um, or in 3v3, having this macro conception of what the classic clash is and what the debate is going to boil down to is also useful for controlling the debate because then you can be like here are the core premises that i need to defend um or here's the wing i need to get out at o2 in order for the judge to be crediting my arguments over theirs it's just a useful thing to do on prep which helps gives you the mental upper hand um, when you're doing debates basically cool then I just want to really just quickly say that this is a big problem that I had as a kid um, and which maybe you guys also do. I'm not sure what your background is, but if you're like a private school kid, for example, or if you've always been really, really academically successful and you've always just been like, yes, I am getting great grades. I am doing debate. I am going to go to a fantastic university. I am now in that university. Like, it's also just important to remember that there are lots of different pathways and goals that education can take, like vocational school, taking apprenticeships, um, or just getting a job straight out of college are all very, very valid options. Community college is a great option, depending on financial circumstances. Bottom line is, you just need to remember this for a couple of reasons. One, this helps to avoid saying classist things, like saying, oh, you won't get into university and that's the end of the world in debates, for example. It gives you a more nuanced picture of the actual roads that get cut off if an actor you're talking about fails to get into university, for example. But two, you can also just run more like open-ended whack arguments that are like, sure, we concede that perhaps it might be more difficult for a person to get into higher education, but we think it's a great thing. And talk about university debt, for example, you can talk about how oftentimes lots of vocational hands on careers are actually much, much more employable than university degrees, given how oversaturated the market is. Um, talking about for profit universities, like all of these kinds of things, just remembering that there are lots of options and you shouldn't pigeonhole your actor is just useful for maintaining flexibility in round. Any questions? Okay. Now let's talk about challenges that the education system faces. First thing I want to just say is that there's a statistic I found out a couple months ago that surprised me a lot, which is just that over half of young Black men who attend urban high schools in America do not graduate, which is a shockingly high statistic. 
it applies mostly to low income public schools um, in densely populated cities in America. Uh, so I just want to chat through a little bit about the various reasons for this huge problem. The first is just there are big internal issues. So for example, there's a lack of literal financial resources. Uh, there's overcrowding, um, i.e. there are 30 or 40 students to one classroom um, and therefore one teacher managing them all. Uh, sometimes it's just impossible to teach technological literacy because you can't afford enough of the tech in order to demonstrate things. Sometimes you can't even share enough class, like tech class resources like textbooks, all of those kind of things which are like internally a problem within the school. But there are also external issues that is, even if the school was perfect um, and there were like 20 kids to one teacher, uh, or if you had free textbooks for everyone, there are still external issues that would be a problem. Um, one of these is that there's a huge, there, there are obviously disproportionate pressures that exist from on students from lower income backgrounds. So for example, if I'm the eldest child, which I am, and I have four siblings, which I don't, um, and my parents were working two shifts a day in order to keep us afloat, that would put huge pressures on me to go home as soon as possible, or to stay home even in order to take care of my siblings, for example, or take care of the housework. Similarly, my parents would not have the mental, would not have the financial ability to do things like send me to extracurricular activities. Um, they might like, there are obviously lots of different inequalities in the resources available to people, which means that school cannot be the first priority for a lot of students, um, which means that dropout rates are high, not because people don't want to study, but because they need to be finding part-time jobs to support their families from a younger age. Um, but the other thing I wanted to talk about is just a failure on the part of schools to connect to them. Um, so for example, there's a trend which means that increasingly public schools in the US, and I'm talking the US because I'm from the US, I'm not, I'm really not, but I study in the US, which means I've debated a lot in the US, which means that unfortunately I now know a lot about the US. But like one problem is that increasingly public schools are teaching more and more AP, like advanced placement programs, which help the wealthier students within the school get into nice colleges. But that comes at the expense of more fundamental programs, such as English second language programs, which are necessary for lots of migrant kids, for example, or remedial classes for kids who might be transferring in from lower income neighborhoods, if that makes sense. So that means that schools are less relevant to people who are low income and face huge pressures outside of school, which means that externally, there are also factors which make school more inaccessible for them. I also wanted to uniquely talk about South Africa and other post-colonial states, um, just because there are also problems, not just within the way in which schools are run, um, but just in terms of the curriculum overall. Um, and this might be true in other countries. Uh, I'm not completely sure. I just know a lot about South Africa, um, which is that the curriculum is very, very trivial um, relative to curriculums in, for example, East Asian countries, which are incredibly rigorous. Um, and I'm sure also Southeast and South Asian countries. And a big, for example, like my South African friends sent me an example of, um, of a maths worksheet, uh, no, sorry, a maths exam paper for their high school graduation. Um, class and one of the questions was about telling the time. Um, so about this amount of time has elapsed um, since the since X person left the house. Now what time is it? So it's quite trivial addition, right? Um, but this is like one of the questions for a high school graduation paper. Um, so there are two main reasons for this lapse. The first is uh, the first and most significant is just colonialism. Um, which is during apartheid, there were two completely separate education systems for white children and also for children of other colors. So for example, Indian kids in South Africa and black kids. Um, and since apartheid and segregation was a thing, they deliberately undermined the quality of education in the lower class of schools, which meant that children were taught skills like housekeeping, um, like basically like home economics, like cooking, sewing, carpentry, basic skills, perhaps some fundamental addition and literacy, um, but definitely not anything uh, highbrow or academic, like history, geography, um, advanced mathematics, physics, science, like that kind of thing. And the problems in the curriculum have persisted, especially because it's a cyclical problem, i.e. If, if the majority of your teachers are trained in that old colonial system, when the standard for education was very, very low, if you drastically shift the curriculum, you then have teachers who are unequipped to teach the new curriculum, right? 
And the other reason is just because there are massive political pressures to increase the grades of kids, basically make sure that the kids are passing their high school exams. But also, it's very, very difficult to suddenly improve the quality of teaching, which means that the ANC's, the African National Congress's response has been to constantly decrease the pass rate from like 60% to 50% to 40%, um, if that makes sense. And through lowering the pass rate, they have had more students pass than in previous years, whereas having the quality of schooling actually decline. So those are like two pressures, right? Political pressures, um, and also just the influence of structural inequality after apartheid and colonialism. Cool. So let's talk about one last thing, which is in public schools, who has a say in these schools? And why is it therefore that there's this disconnect between the lowest income members of the community and the services they're provided at public schools? And the answer is just who has a say in these schools. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have this, but I went to like a system of education where we had PTAs, like parent teacher associations, where like parents would come in and like talk to the school board. Uh, maybe there'd be like one or two student council members to act as like the token student representatives there too. Um, I'm very disillusioned after student council. Um, anyway, the point of that is that the, the reason why there's so much, uh, there, that there's this disconnect is often because the white middle-class, wealthy, well-off parents have a far bigger say in these schools. One, because they have the time, the mental resources, and the money to take a day off and come in for parent-teacher conferences and they have a say. But also because trivially, they just invest in the school, um, like they make donations, and also just things such as um, schools want to attract these families because for the issues we discussed earlier, i.e. the external pressures that exist on children of color and those from lower income backgrounds mean that they often have lower academic attainments. So schools want to attract rich white middle-class families, which means they often kowtow to them and bow to their interests, which is like the bottom line reason why so many public schools actually fail to cater to their most important audience. Any questions? Okay, fire. Now, um, I mix up the order of this presentation a little bit because I feel like there was a natural segue um, between that and how parents interact with education. Um, so this house believes that governments should actually combat gentrification is something that connects to the earlier observation about who has a say in these schools, i.e. Um, a big reason why, like what's the main op argument against combating gentrification? Um, it could be that whenever small communities are gentrified, it's oftentimes large groups of people moving in. So the state will have to literally stop a large group of people from accessing a certain quality. And oftentimes in democracies, that's not feasible for a state. Sorry, was that an op argument? Yep. That is that it's good to, it's bad to actually combat gentrification because now lots of people will move in and therefore state services will increase in quality. Um, it's like states should not stop gentrification from happening because if it tries to do so, it will offend a larger group of people, which is not feasible in a democracy. Like it'll piss people off. Yeah. Off yeah. yeah. So a backlash thing. argument does work. Um, cool. People from lower income backgrounds would not be able to adapt. So that's good. Can you explain in more detail why? that have like why is it that they would uh, need to yeah. adapt so like uh people from low economic backgrounds uh have like uh lived in poverty for most uh -huh. of their lives so they have like uh, got gotten used to like a uh, like a living standard in that sense and like a point of time like you have gentrification or uh, and you have like a like a lot of uh, urbanization in that sense not really like living costs increases yeah. with, uh it, like affects them severely and they're not able to like uh, afford that in a sense but also yeah. like there are a lot of uh, I mean social stigmas and all surrounding uh, like uh, them coming like they're not able to adapt and just so easily. yeah that's definitely a gov argument though um what I'm looking for is the most obvious argument on opposition which is against actively combating gentrification so if I asked you oh my, my apologies I no all good. it happens argument. so if I asked you why is gentrification good even if you don't think gentrification is good, what would you say? Um, I'm not sure, but I think one thing you could potentially say is that 
when you sort of move people into different areas, oftentimes they're then matched with services that don't actively serve them. So if you wanted to put education into that, right, you're then moved into these schools, which have things like primarily AP courses, or like more advanced extracurriculars, when in reality, what they need is things like ESL, or uh, remedial courses. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's the gov rebuttal to the main op argument. The main op argument is a gentrification is good because it leads to an increase in the services and jobs right as we just got in the chat yeah trickle down basically that when more rich people come in they buy more things different people can make more money and also services increase because now they lobby the government for more investment into tra into like transport for example or education or things like i don't know policing um and then the gov rebuttal is just like the problem with this is that you adapt the services to ultimately suit the needs of the incoming group which actually pushes out the needs of the pre-existing community who are lower income and have different needs um, to what the income um, incomers have. Cool, so that was the discussion on gentrification and how education factors into that. So now just talking about how parents interact with education. So this is relevant to a whole bunch of stuff. The first thing to note is that parents are very, very relevant to education. So it, it's relevant to overcoming um, overcoming the pressures of uh, poverty, for example. For example, if parents are willing to send kids to schools um, unconditionally on having them have high, having make, conditionally on the children having high academic performance and therefore getting welfare payments for it, that's a very, very good way to make sure that kids stay in school, right? Um, so talking about how the family dynamic and how parents see schooling, is often relevant to attaining educational outcomes and education debates. And also relevant to like a couple other types of notions. So for example, um, teaching socially progressive material in school um, and religious schools, like the teaching socially progressive material in schools, just the, the class debate of like, this has to make sex education in schools and conservative areas a mandatory subject. What's the gov? Um, it helps to change them in a way that's going to be beneficial for them in the future. Yeah, absolutely. That is, when I'm taught about what condoms are and why they're important, I'm less likely to get an STD or get pregnant, right? Having basic lessons about consent also really, really important towards reducing incidences of sexual harassment and even assault um, among teenagers. Cool. But what's the op? Um, I think potentially that if you're teaching them in a conservative area, the parents are going to get angry and mm -hmm. not let their child participate at all, which would take away the limited sex ed they're receiving right now. Yes, but that's a little under nuanced. Insofar as all proper parties say, yeah, but like sending your kid to school is kind of mandatory, right? You could say that there's a small proportion of parents who are so hard line that they'd rather pull their kids out of school, send them to like a private school or send them or homeschool them instead. Um, but then the benefit is kind of marginal, right? Um, what then is the more likely harm that will happen in most families and households? Can we talk about how uh, making it mandatory would probably mean that you won't be able to bring in teachers that can tease a subject to the children because their parents, the entire school faculty and the students themselves don't want to learn that. They think it's not right to learn or not, um, I don't know, good to learn it in a particular system. So you won't have good teaching and you won't be able to transfer as much knowledge. Yeah, so that's one good thing, which is just this leads to problems, i.e. there will be huge conflict and resistance from schools. Which, and what's the impact of that? The impact of that isn't people are angry. The impact of that is it's implemented badly, i.e. it's taught shoddily, reluctantly, unclearly, which might actually lead to more mistakes, because honestly, the consequences of sex are being taught badly is probably worse than being, kids being taught to be abstinent, for example. Does that make sense? Like, can you see what the harms might be of being mistakenly taught something wrong? But also what Lauren just said in the chat, right? Which is just parents would provide counter arguments at home. So what's the impact of that? Because presumably what Prop will say, yeah, sure, maybe parents and conservatives will disagree with you, but that doesn't matter because at least the kids still know how to have safe sex, right? Therefore, what's the actual strong argument from off about what the impact is of having parents disagree with you and undermine you? Shh. 
sure a rift between parents and the kids is very very is is true but i think it's hard for optus to prove that the rift is so irreversible that it's going to be it's, it's going to like outweigh the gov harms the gov benefits if that makes sense like you could um especially if there's like an asian country or something um but it's somewhat like tricky um given our context that we were just talking about you know the importance of having parent cooperation when it comes to children's schoolings what is the op impact yeah jake's wasn't bad i just go a bit further right and say look if we're talking about really really low income areas which often correlate with more hardline religious um slash more conservative areas in the us for example or perhaps in other countries that's actually really really bad because by pushing too hard on something that parents are unwilling to compromise on you actually have to sacrifice parent support on other key educational outcomes so for example why are parents really, really important in making sure that kids have decent schooling? Three reasons. Sure, help them with schoolwork is a good one. I wouldn't run they pay for the education just because refusing to pay for the education is not an option because in most countries it's kind of legally mandatory to send kids to school and presumably um, a lot of these schools are public but we have one which is parents are relevant because they help with schoolwork even though I think that's honestly the least relevant um, mechanism what are the other two there are lots Why is it that if your parents value schooling a lot, that, that, that's actually likely to increase your own educational attainment? And try to break out of the elite bubble a little bit. I'm thinking about people who might have lower educational um, attainments. Yeah, yeah, all this is fine. Um, my concern is just that it's a little, they're likely to, it's a, a little bit like, um ideal um because like yeah parents might refuse to send them to extracurricular activities or they might not go to the pta um or like they might not help them with schoolwork but all of these kind of assume that the parents are actually pretty educated um slash well-to-do people and therefore they're not necessarily the group that we're so concerned about being really really pissed off um yeah yeah sure like yeah absolutely like invest sacrificing things in order to pay for school is a big one um but yeah like i would just be again more human when we're talking about education debates and we're talking about families just go to the most bottom line think about your own experience with your parents right um my mechanisms that i was thinking of was one when your parents are really 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 obsessed with your education and convinced that that's what's going to help you come out of poverty for example or at least believe that it's going to make you a better person that's the point at which they pressure you to do well in school as well, right? Because, and that changes the way kids behave because I fundamentally care about what my parents think of me. I want their validation, I want their praise, or because like that's when my parents are willing to, in times of extreme economic like shock, for example, to do things like be like, fine, I'm willing to pay the electricity bills for you to keep the light on through the night so you can do homework and study, for example. So that overall thing that your parents' attitude towards studying shapes children's attitudes toward their own expectations and standards for themselves in school as well right but two just things such as like slacking like parents are crucial when it comes to enforcing standards of school sets because school fundamentally has no authority over the kid outside of school right who actually punishes the child when they don't do their homework who's the person who's going to force their kid to go to school and tell them off for skiving at the end of the day, the worst the school can do is give you a detention, for example. But the biggest threat is often, I'm going to go and tell your parents. And the parents are the ones who actually impose real disciplinary measures. Um, so having the parents' cooperation and trust 
it's incredibly important for schools to make good progress um, with kids. And then we can add additional stuff about material support, about actively helping them with homework. But I hope you kind of understand how the most fundamental claim is about how your parents' attitude towards school shapes your attitude towards school. And parents' cooperation is intrinsic towards imposing discipline on children, for example. Yeah, I like this, but the relevance isn't really, uh, but what's the relevance? Like, this is a good argument to make, but why is it that teaching socially progressive material in school would cause this harm? It just seems like a, like a stock argument that I don't understand how it perfectly applies in this case. Does that make sense? Or I'm just not seeing the link. It could just be I'm being slow. Oh, um, yeah, no, you can definitely make that argument. Um, uh, the thing is, though, in these cases, parents are already extremely, um, extremely motivated. Um, I don't really, I've never really debated about this in motions other than this has progressed the glamorization slash glorification of certain professions, e.g. medicine, um, engineering, law, um, wherein the debate is about whether or not, wherein the debate is, again, the trade-off between a child's mental health and well-being versus their eventual long-term success, um, right? And the other debate that I can see this argument applying to is about this house supports or regrets tiger parenting. Um, I guess this is a great frame. It's not necessarily an argument, but it's a way for teams to argue that the reason why parents pressure you to be academically successful isn't necessarily that they care about you, but rather because they see themselves in you and they want to vicariously uh, like achieve their goals through you, which is just a way to characterize parents as imperfect actors, if that makes sense. Okay. Cool. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that answers the problem. If there are still confusions, just unmute and ask or just text in the chat. The final thing I wanted to talk about under this main idea um, is just about religious schools. So a motion I've debated before is this house believes that laïcité has done more good than harm. And laïcité is a French word that just means secularism. Um, and the reason why we use the French is just because it's the label for a broad set of policies that basically dictate that religion needs to be completely separate from public life, which bans, for example, our religious schools. Um, and a core argument within them is just that madrasas and language schools are actually really, really good. The trade-off is between, you know, um, fulfilling the child's like, okay. And the argument for this, uh, uh, for madrasas and language schools is that even the argument against them is just that this is bad for integration. Um, you can't just say, who are the kids who are likely to be the ones sent to these language schools. They're likely to be the ones who are coming from a migrant background, for example, and who come from a country where religion is the most important thing. So for you to force them to jump from that environment to a school where you're surrounded by white kids um, and a French speaking teacher you don't fully understand, who is telling you that God isn't real um, when God was the most important thing in your life back home, then that's a huge and irreversible shift. It's a sense of cognitive dissonance. But beyond that, you can also run arguments about how madrasas and language schools and that sense of connection and identity is actually much, much more important than this ideal of achieving integration. Um, just because a fun fact about religious extremism in Europe, for example, the ISIS brides, the young British girls who actually went to Syria to join ISIS, for example, were not first generation migrant girls, but rather the children of migrants who had chosen to leave their countries for the Europe for a better life. And the reason for this is because secularism in public schools and the idea of like European homogeneity actually is really, really alienating for second generation kids and diaspora children who feel like they don't belong at schools, are alienated. And therefore, when trying to get a sense of who, what their identity really, really is, then default to the actors who are trying the hardest to connect to them, which is often terrorist agencies who have an ulterior motive, right? Um, and making arguments about religious schools and how oftentimes parents are happier to send their kids there or trust them more because they speak a similar language or understand they have common values. And therefore that overall schooling and educational attainment would be higher in these schools. is just basically another argument for them. Any questions? Okay.
let's talk about inequality. Okay, so lots of inequality exists. This is true in Hong Kong. I'm sure it's also true in the US and in the UK and wherever you are. That is that there's a huge disparity between the educational quality of private versus public schools. Ooh. Um, can we say this doesn't support the equity policy as the space explains people according to your religions? Yes, that is an op argument. I just think that it's a bit hard because um, if you're self-selecting as supposed to forcing people to attend, then it's unclear why people choosing to stick to their, their themselves is morally wrong. If that makes sense. But you can definitely make arguments about how language schools or madrasas are often underfunded um, because they're seen as catering to a small and unimportant group of people and therefore deserving of less funding if it's a government school or people are just able to pay lower fees if they cater truly to immigrants. Like a big problem in Hong Kong is that we have language schools um, catering almost exclusively to refugees and immigrants from North Africa or Southeast Asia. And they're really super underfunded because the Hong Kong government doesn't care about colored people. Yeah, okay. Um, now let's talk a bit more about inequality. Private versus public schooling, huge gap. Um, zoning laws is another reason why there is a huge gap in educational quality and so is legacy admissions. So first let's talk about zoning laws. Zoning laws is a thing in the US um, it might also be true in other countries too, but you might encounter it if you debate internationally because everyone's obsessed with the US. Basically, um, the zoning laws are a reason why even between public schools, the educational gap can be really, really huge. Um, so for example, there are some state schools that are pretty good and some which are absolutely terrible. And that's oftentimes based on the geographical location of these schools. So. Gerrymandering zoning means that districts are carved up into separate zones. And oftentimes these divides exist along racial and economic lines, which means that some zones are just radically less well off than others. Um, and that also makes their schools far worse because that means that there are fewer donations happening to these schools, but also means that these are schools in less politically active areas which means that there's less pressure to improve the quality of education in these neighborhoods. Does that make sense? Um, and also just arguments to be made about how, like how pooling all the low income kids together and pooling all the middle income kids together means that you get the magnification of external factors. So for example, even if it's like 30 middle-class kids in a, in a public school, the quality of education in the public school is likely to be slightly higher because their parents are likely to have gone to school and be able to help them with schoolwork because they'll be able, the parents will be able to buy them textbooks, buy them stationery, buy them uniforms, make them half up in school, buy them things like laptops, um, or their parents will just care, have the energy to force them to go to school, which means that the average standard of learning in these classes is higher. Um, whereas in a low income school, there might be larger issues with dropout um, or about attendance rates, um, or just about making sure that there are enough resources to go around which means that the magnification of income variables means that in between different zones, the standard of, uh, standard of education is massive. Cool. Finally, legacy admissions. Legacy admissions is just the thing about how um, if your parents or siblings or relatives have gone to a school, that means that you get priority to enter them. And that's really, really bad because it means that a lot of the most selective schools in the country just have the same families um, and often same ethnic groups, um, i.e. white people and East Asian people entering over and over and over again and excluding those who are trying to squeeze a foot in the door. Yeah, so these are like random reasons why American and probably also other countries' educational systems are messed up and perpetuate inequality, but they're also inalienable slash structural reasons for inequality, which is that even if zoning was not a thing, even if private schools are totally abolished, even if there were no legacy admissions, there would probably be, still be vast inequality between schools and children because the impact that parents' education, background, and class have a huge impact on children's academic success. Um, for one, because parents' class has an effect on early childhood, i.e. 
if my parents are well off and one of my parents can afford to stay at term and look after you as a little kid, that empirically means that that child is likely to be socialized to have a huge amount of interaction with their parent, which means that they might learn to speak or write earlier because their parents are talking to them all the time. It might mean that they're actually um, better at, have a better grasp of the fundamentals of math or object permanence because there's a parent at home playing with them all the time as opposed to if the parent is constantly working. It means that the parent gives them academic support in school, enrolls them in extracurricular activities and things like help and tuition centers, and also is able to do things like grant them extra work experience by linking them up with buddies. Um, in the workplace, for example. So all of these reasons mean that inequality is often impossible to eliminate and perpetuates itself. And yeah, this is often like, there are often core clashes in debates which are really, really repetitive um, and are the same in different debates. So for example, this task would impose quotas in schools for racial minorities. This task would require children in private schools to get higher baseline grades in order to enter university. Both of these have the same core clash Guess what it is? Um. I don't think that the private school thing is true. Like definitely diplomats because children of diplomats often are well off or have connections to wealthy families. But I'm not sure about the children of criminals. Yes, but do you think Op can really win by saying we care more about the well-educated's access to education? Yeah, so there's one core stakeholder group, which is racial minorities or people who are worse off. So basically vulnerable groups. And the core, and the point of the debate is, is arguing which side is better at making them well off. Um, so the Gov line is really, really obvious. That is that we're able to help them get into better schools. But what's the op line? Uh, I feel like it's a discussion about how, um, a, it's tokenistic because um, probably you'll still, um, you there is no real impact. Like even if you get them through the doors of that school, um, mm -hmm. you're still not going to be learning well because there are other forms of inequalities that you're facing mm -hmm. that aren't solved by the admission process being more equitable. Mm -hmm. um, That's good. It's slightly mitigatory, but you could make it offensive by saying, the impact isn't that they don't learn fully, but rather that they might learn actively worse than a counterfactual. But what's an offensive argument? And it might sound like a dumb argument, but it's a classic debate, and this is just what Stanley argued. Did you read about the Harvard admissions scandal? Uh, yep, they basically discriminated against Asian Americans. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, Asian. but you also read about it, right? Like Asian Americans freaked the fuck out. They were like, this is terrible. My kids worked so hard. How dare you? These African Americans and Latinos don't deserve it anyways. They just don't work as hard as we do. Like all of this really, really toxic, terrible discourse, right? Um, so the main op line is honestly backlash. Um, yeah, the general solitude of parents of the majority how do we make a backlash argument into an actual winning argument? Because like the, all, the really flippant proper response is we should never sacrifice progressive change and help for the minorities in order to bow, bow to the angriness of the majority because the oppressors who have been forced to change their ways are always gonna be pissed off. So why is it that backlash might actually tangibly hurt kids? Yeah, these minorities aren't treated well in schools. Um, why? Paint me a picture, don't just say that, because if it's really, really black and white, and um, they're just told you're not treated well in school, the gov response is just, haha, but you're still in the school. Um, and that educational attainment is the most important thing. So why is it actually actively bad? So it may be the case that like when there are African-Americans or whoever, like they've been given quota to, 
uh, like the majority students are uh, talking to the other students in the way that like you have got here because of this very quota and because mm-hmm. of like the uh, I mean uh, uh, the reservations that you have, you've been given and that you actually do not deserve the opportunities that you're getting and such and so. Yeah. So a big one is psychological distress for the kids who themselves are like forced to endure this kind of backtalk from their peers. But another is just the ability to fit into a school is arguably just as important to your schooling as is as like what you're told by the teacher. Because like plausibly, you could run arguments about how, yeah, sure, maybe your teachers are slightly better at uh, learning, but the racial minorities or people from Um, public schools who enter these universities um, and schools on either side are likely to be the ones who are slightly more high achieving. Um, The reason why that matters is because on either side of the house, they're from schools which are capable of giving them decent education. The difference is that, yeah, that's a big one, i.e. the teachers themselves might be racist, but another one might just be the reason why Eton, for example, is so great is partly because of so many resources, but it's also to a large extent because they have so many connections and when you leave the school there's this old boys network um which means that you're able to get each other jobs for example or we have recommendation letters and all of that kind of thing um and that actually entering these schools when you're perceived as a pity or a charity case or stealing the spot of someone more deserving actively excludes you from being able to access these benefits but moreover actually makes your social skills and your ability to grow into a leader actively worse um, because A, you are just discriminated against by your peers, but moreover, you might generally just have an adjustment period because you might be moving from a school with a lower educational attainment average to one which is really, really competitive. Um, you might struggle. That might actually reinforce people's views of you as actually inferior as a student. Um, and all of these reasons are really, really harrowing, not just for you, but for the community at large. I agree. I still think that these arguments are not as strong as the Gov because the Gov is able to prove such a tangible benefit. But the op path to victory is one, mitigate the hell out of the Gov benefit, say the alternatives are actually not bad, and three, say there are huge psychological harms that make the child actually worse off. And this is bad for the community at large because the wave of backlash and hate incited is just not worth a marginal increase in the speed and the pace of reform. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Now let's talk about the social world of schools. Um, so yeah, there are lots of ideas about what's, okay, what kind of alternatives would you employ? So I'm not sure, I don't think the option counter model um, because I guess op could say like scholarships, for example, um, in order to make schooling technically more accessible, but I wouldn't go as far as to be like, I wouldn't do anything much more drastic because a large part of the op case is probably also about meritocracy um, and that kind of thing. Um, What I would do on op is say one, I think it's actually super, 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 super important to make sure that people of color or people from low income backgrounds who are relatively higher achieving stay in public schools because that lifts the overall standard of education for everyone else within that community who would have no chance at entering one of these private schools, for example. Does that make sense? Are you kind of getting me? It's an intersectional argument about how those who'd be lucky enough to benefit from these um, from these quotas are a small, small group of, are small and the luckiest group of those people overall, and not actually the most vulnerable. So what's actually more important is to keep them in the existing public school system, such that you have a such that they pull the overall standard of schooling up and everyone in that class is able to benefit, for example. So that's one claim. You just need to paint a picture of an alternative trend, which is acceptable. For example, the public schools overall are getting more attention um, or that, yeah, like, for example, that there are private schools are increasingly offering scholarships because they want to be perceived as equitable um, or they're doing things such as uh, doing scholarships because they actually want the highest achieving low-income kids because that's something that actually increases their overall standard of, of educational attainment, like that kind of thing. Um, could I please repeat the op winning checklist? One, mitigate the hell out of the gov benefit. Um, two, dis- say that there's a good alternative that is mutually exclusive from the gov. Three, stress the harms 
that would occur to the individual child, but also the community at large that would happen as a result of this policy? Okay, so now trying about the social role of schools. So yeah, one is socialization, as we mentioned earlier, like school is probably where you make made your first friends. Um, it's helped you grow as a person. You're a different person than you were in middle school. And part of that is because you had embarrassing mistakes in school, which you now regret and would never do again. But basically like it teaches you what's okay and not okay to do. Like that's what socialization is. It's just process of trial and error. It's a process of internalizing norms that people are telling you, which shapes the way in which you interact with people going forward. So that's one rule of schools. But two, an interesting nugget about schools as, is that they have an important role as childcare services in low income neighborhoods too. For example, that, you know, kids, parents who work all day need somewhere to put their kids, schools serve that function. But also things such as Michelle Obama's legacy as first lady was to a large extent her project to, to have free school lunches in public schools in America. And that's important for a couple of reasons. One, obviously this helps with children's educational attainment if they're not hungry. This helps with ensuring a basic standard of nutrition if you're getting your fiber, your vitamins, or your calcium in during your school lunch. But third of all, it also just increases school attendance and participation because even if you're not so sure about whether you're benefiting from school in the first place, the fact that you can get that lunch is a big and tangible reason to go to school and for parents to push for their kids to go to school. But there are also just also stories like having warm clothes, like warmth, for example. Yeah, like kind of a morale boost, but also just, if I don't think that school is, school is worth going to because I have existential pressures on my mind, the fact that school itself helps relieve that existential pressure is a reason to go to it. And takes away one of the biggest detractors. Um, but also just things such as schools act being like the only warm heated buildings um, during winters, for example, like all of these kinds of things means that schools aren't just there to act as education centers. They're also there to act as social centers where parents interact with each other, where children go to socialize, but also live. Um, after we spend a huge amount of time there, it's very, very important. So the reason why we have all those observations is one, I don't know, like they're just reasons to really, really emphasize the role of schools as a safe haven in the short, immediate term. Um, so it's another framing device. But yeah, let's also talk about how schools are involved in education and development and in governments and politics. So yeah, um, I'm sure that you guys often generically say that, ah, we believe in a set of policies to increase the economic development of these countries. For example, we think that government should invest heavily in education. Um, so let's just think a little bit about how that works. So one, investing in education isn't always a fast track to solving educational problems. For example, education is actually very well funded in America, but the standard, like the result, the standard of education overall is still quite crap for a couple of reasons. One, because it's allocated really, 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 really um, unequally, as we mentioned earlier, but also just things such as it's used very inefficiently. Um, teachers unions are very powerful. It means that teachers are never fired, for example, even if they do terrible things, um, things like that. So it's necessary, funding them well is necessary, but it's not enough on its own. But two, we mentioned earlier that there are lots of external factors, which also mean that educational outcomes vary, even if schools are doing a perfect job. So improving education is always one tool that is used in a package of tools to increase, econ increase economic growth because alleviating immediate short-term pressure on families is a prerequisite towards making sure that kids are able to focus on school. So my favorite case study for when education reform was used really, really well is actually in Brazil, um, where Lula da Silva, who was a corrupt, but I think a somewhat effective socialist politician who was a president slash prime minister of Brazil for some time, implemented a policy called Brasil Familia, uh, Bolsa Familia, sorry. 
And the point of both of the media was basically just say, we will make you eligible for various direct cash transfers slash small loans only if you send your child to school. So that was a way to guarantee that kids would go to school and human capital would increase. But it was also a way of making sure that conditional loans were going to families who would then use it well, if that makes sense. So it's a double whammy. One, we give you loans, which helps you build up your own small business, but we also make sure your kids stay in school, which increases educational level overall. Cool. Um, and the second main thing I wanted to talk about is just governments and education. Um, so there are actually a couple of interesting clashes here. Um, education systems in democracies versus autocracies. Um, and when have schools been a tool for political control? So using your common sense, would you say that assuming that a democracy and an autocracy has the exact same income level, which society would have the higher educational level? Which school, which society would have the higher literacy rate, for example? The democracy. Why? Um, I feel like it's because um, there is a higher pressure to spread the overall development to more people. In autocracies, it's probably just the elite who are getting the benefits of that educational system. Wrong. It's actually autocracies. Autocracies have a generally higher average level of educational attainment for a couple of reasons. The first is just absolutely. You would intuitively imagine that there's lots of political pressure to do things such as improve education democracies, right? Um, but just use your intuition for a sec. USA, ed democracy, shit education system. India, democracy, not the greatest. Um, lots of different facts and figures which suggest that in democratic countries, educational standards and attainment is actually not super high. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that even though this is in Africa a good thing, education is also a very long-term issue, right? I.e., if I, as a president, pour huge amounts of money into reforming the educational, yeah, absolutely, autocracies can impose it onto them and also in But like the point is that democracy, it's a, for democracy, if I pour money into improving the education system, are the benefits gonna show during my four years in power? No, because probably by the time I get it passed, it's at least my second or third year, and then people graduate, um, and then they find jobs. So the benefits of higher human capital or better literacy rates are probably only gonna happen in three, four, five, six, seven, even a decade at best, because that's how much time it takes for a child to pass through an educational system fully, right? Which means that for the amount of political capital and energy and money required, it's actually, you're just delivering benefits to the next president or the next party after you, right? So there's actually an active disincentive to invest heavily in education um, because it's not a short-term fix that is gonna improve your popularity and your chances of re-election. Um, democratic voters are often short-termist and also people are just more likely to vote on single issues that are very, very emotively powerful rather than long-term objectively good policy. So for example, Trump winning basically on a set of slogans about bringing jobs back to America, um, about how we're gonna take power away from the swamp, we're gonna jail up corrupt Clinton, like all of these kinds of ideas, right? Which means that politicians often don't campaign on these bases. On the other hand, why is it that autocratic countries might actually have a strong incentive to invest heavily in education systems? Um, I don't know if this is the case, but oftentimes in a lot of autocracies, um, it's seen like that you give up your freedom, but instead you get like constant economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so education is often seen as a way to achieve that. So that's just oftentimes like governments really want to ensure that their like country continues to function well economically. And one way to do that is through education. Plus it's like the opposite of like the long-term, like yeah. they have long-term to do it in. Absolutely. Looking at that response and the chat, I've actually thought of like four, like you've brainstormed four different reasons why auto autocracies are better. So one is what Julia just said about um, their idea about how we have lots of benign autocracies. Um, we're in benign autocracies. 
So they're like, ah, I may be in power, but ultimately I am for the good of the country. Something, something Park Jun He, something, something Lee Kuan Yew, that kind of thing. Um, but two, we also have the idea that autocracies just literally have the capacity to do so. Um, I.e., when you have absolute control and your bureaucracy is a lot tighter, and you're literally just cleansing your your political and system of corrupt people, inefficient people, that often means that you're actually better able to get change done quickly. But three, there's a strong, strong desire to do well in order to gain legitimacy, which is somewhat close to what Judy suggested. But finally, and most interestingly, it's actually also invested in heavily to prevent insurgencies and rebels, not just because of dissatisfaction, but also because education is used as a tool of political control, right? I.e., if I invest heavily in the education system and I write the curriculum myself, that's a fantastic way to shape the hearts and minds of the young generation, as well as to make them feel indebted to me. A really fun case study is that the Libyan like the Libyan government under Muammar Gaddafi actually had a really, really surprisingly high rate of literacy. And that's because Gaddafi himself was really obsessed with education. Like he himself was involved in designing the history and the geography curriculum of the school, uh, of the of public schools across Libya. Um, and that was because he perceived education as the way to get into the hearts of kids. Um, one fun fact is that he, they actually redrew the map of Northern Africa to make a Libya bigger but also to make the stretch of desert separating Libya from its neighbors bigger, to make it seem more difficult to leave the country, and as well as to make it seem like there are more opportunities and space within Libya itself. So like that's just one relatively whack case study, but can easily also point to more relevant case studies. For example, the fact that, um, choosing my examples carefully given that I live in Hong Kong, Okay, I'll just roll with South Africa. Um, the fact that the ANC is always portrayed in a really, really positive light um, in South African history books, but no, that's a bad example because like the really plausibly apartheid was like definitely very, very bad and the ANC was definitely quite good. But like a clear, a clear cut example for when it's definitely used political control is Russia, um, wherein Putin himself has a big say and the way history curriculums are designed. And public schools really, really emphasize the role of uh, the Soviet Union in pushing back the wave of fascism. And this kind of rhetoric and imagery is also repeated all the time in Putin's speeches. And he frames himself as the new coming of the USSR, pushing back the newest tide of fascism um, encroaching from Europe or from America. So yeah. There are pros and cons to having the government very, very deeply involved in education. Pros being oftentimes literacy rate increases. Cons being this is definitely used as a tool of crowd control um, and brainwashing and is used as one tool by autocratic regimes. So that's where I'm at. The final thing I had on this slide is actually just, oh shit. Okay, you know what, yeah. Um, I forgot to delete um, the stuff from the last time I gave this presentation, which is for Debate for All, which is a South Korean company. Um, but okay, basically what I wanted to wrap this session up with was a little bit of just practice of this house of banned private schools. So I personally see, I think a couple of main clashes in this debate. Can we actually just take a step back and think for maybe a minute or two and come back with what we think the main arguments on prop and op are? There are more ideas to this. This is just what the classes working with then suggested to me first. Um, I think a proper argument could be about how oftentimes in many private schools, you don't, uh, you don't have like an affordable fee structure. So some parents are spending millions and thousands while others don't get to um others don't get to have that kind of education from a public school because there isn't money going into public schools there there's only money going to this sector which is very unequal yes. I, I forgot the word yeah that's 
that is not, that, that is the word but that's the negative half of the argument can you complete the argument and give me the positive half too um if we have more equal system of education everybody gets to access education which is a basic right which is needed to for needed in order to live your life at the fullest extent and that is a right that we should end out to everybody which is not being end out to everybody in the status quo mm. i think when i want to go a bit further and say just there is an argument to be made on prop not just that uh status quo is incredibly unequal and we make things less unequal but that when we ban private schools actually the quality of education overall increases um overall because rich parents are now forced to actually invest in the public schooling system because the children of government officials for example don't go to overseas boarding schools or don't go to the fanciest most selective universities um, of a country but rather are forced to go to the same kind of schools as everyone else so standard and quality of education goes up one rich kids are not as bad which is what i got in the chat um what else especially ideas from op2 um, this is an idea for prop but you could potentially talk about increased socialization between different um, areas or like between different classes because if all of the rich kids are sequestered off in their own little world you often don't get those interactions which can break down things like classism mm -hmm. so one impact is rich kids are less horrible and another one is that there's less classism the reason why i have separate impacts is because one really valuable thing to remember is sometimes you set yourself a very high burden. So for example, Julia, the form of argument you just had, which is there's less classism, is kind of difficult to prove because op could just be really, really glib and be like, no, there are so many reasons why even if I see a beggar on the street, my intuition to say he didn't work hard enough, he deserves to be there. Um, whereas if you have a spectrum of different impacts, so for example, look, in the best case scenario, we significantly mitigate classism and we make things much better for poor kids, but on our, in our worst case scenario, even if we aren't, aren't, aren't able to fix that, we at least make rich kids less awful. We'll make them slightly more empathetic, we'll make them slightly less ignorant um, about the situation that everyone else lives in. Yep, nice, nice. That's a really good argument from that fear. But basically what I'm looking for, sorry. Sorry, is there like an op case about how um, the parents who of the kids who previously went to private schools would like use their capital to divert like public funding to the public schools like in the districts with lots of rich kids. Absolutely. That all you get is stratification of quality of schooling among public schools. And why is that bad? Maybe it would be like, um, one, like the inequality still exists, but two, like mm -hmm. for the for the like poorer or lower income kids who relied on the public schools for their education, like the quality of the education for them within those public schools would get worse as well. Absolutely, yeah. I think the second the second impact is much stronger. The first is kind of mitigation, and you'd kind of have to concede that inequality is uh, a priori bad, which is kind of difficult um, because like you even though inequality isn't completely solved on their side, they probably solve it more than you do. But the harm that is, schooling gets way worse for the worst off. Yeah, basically a similar argument. Um, reduce competition among teachers because pay grade in a public school is limited. Sure, no, absolutely. That is that, not that competition goes down, but that you get fewer qualified professionals choose to go into teaching. Uh, a lot of time pri uh, private schools have, uh, they, they have better funding and they put more into their educational policies and structure. So it is bet they, they have a better standard of uh, education. So if we do ban that private school, that though a lot of time the governments what the governments do is they take the structure, they take the model from the private schools and try to implement it in the public sector. And if you don't have private schools, you cannot take that model from anywhere, and you do not yeah. have that structure to put something in. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. 
So I just wanted to be a little bit more like macro about this debate because so far we're just eating ideas on. Looking at this motion that this has to ban public private schools, I think there are two main clashes. The first clash is just about whether or not the quality of education goes up or down. Um, Gov has arguments that is when rich kids go to public schools and their parents donate, quality increases. When the children of politicians go to these schools, you get reform. When children who went to public schools grow up and become politicians, you get policy change. Like these are reasons which prop gets better schools, but op also has a bunch of reasons why quality of schooling decreases, right? I.e., they get stratification, so the poor schools get less funding. That the overall quality of education decreases um, because there's less competition in between schools and you can't look at private schools. But also, if you're qualified professionals, choose to go into teaching, right? So the way you'd resolve this clash is explaining which word is more plausible. Um, and I think there's another clash, which is just, is it, is, which is just framing, is education an absolute right? And if so, is it justified to have differences in the quality that we access? Because I actually think that if I were on op, I would go really, really hard and say private schools are fantastic because they provide unique services. For example, deaf schools, for example, schools for people who are uh, mentally impaired, for example, or schools who are explicitly for LGBTQ plus children or girls schools, boys schools, that kind of thing. I.e. that when you have a private school, the free market corrects for everything, basically, whereas the gov would be about market failure. So this argument would boil down to free market on op versus market is failing. We need the government to step in and correct it. And the government has good incentives on gov. Because remember our argument I, uh, earlier about, about how governments use schooling as a method of political control. Eliminating private schools really, really, really magnifies their ability to have absolute control over the mental headspaces um, of kids, people, everyone who goes to school, basically. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if that's clear, um, but basically my process for thinking of these core clashes is twofold. One, I think about what the most important issue in the debate is. Intuitively, this is about low income students being the most important thing, right? If I went on that, I went on everything. Um, but the second thing I do is I just do a bit of preemption and thinking about what the world would look like on either side. Um, and once I understand that and I build up both arguments, I then think about how to resolve these clashes. And I find that it eventually boils down to a very traditional clash, which is about the government versus the free market, which is a better actor. True empathy is when the better emotion of state for privileges. True, this argument does work, but you definitely need to color it. Um, when you're making arguments about how people think, the most important thing is just to give reasons for each step or paint a picture of the emotions people would feel. Because if you ran this argument um, on op, my gov would just be rich kids are fucking ungrateful on either way. Um, and they're actually way more ungrateful on your side because on your side, we live in total ignorance because they're so sheltered and protected from everyone else. Whereas on gov, when you see the disparity in the clothes you're wearing, the food you're eating, how tired you are, what you're doing for fun, all of that means that you clearly see and understand the disparity in the quality of life you experience from other people. Um, which means that in order for you to run the argument on how rich kids are less grateful on our side, you do need to add more color and explain why that is a feeling that's likely to be going through a kid's head. Okay, so that's all for today.